Good evening and welcome. We would like to start the January 14th meeting of the Jefferson County Public Schools, the Jefferson County Board of Education. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Prior to this meeting, the board held a work session to receive an update regarding the work of the Student Assignment Review Advisory Committee. No action was taken. At this time, as we start, we said several times since we've been here, it's a new day, it's a new year. So let's focus on what our goals are as we move forward in the new year as we go into our uh, traditional moment of silence, please. Thank you. If you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, I would appreciate it. I saw some young men from the Du Bois Academy. Are they still here? I really would appreciate it if they'd come up and help us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Last minute, I'm sorry, gentlemen. Thank you, gentlemen. Our vision statement this evening will be read by board member Linda Duncan. Ms. Duncan. Well, our vision is for all Jefferson County Public School students to graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and to contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse shared world. Thank you very much. Every year at our January meeting, we are required uh, to organize the board, which means the election of the chairperson and the vice chairperson at this time. So the organizational meeting of the Board of Education of Jefferson County is convened in accordance with KRS 160.160, which requires boards of education to elect a chairperson and a vice chairperson for terms fixed by the board. Board Policy 01.41 requires that this be done annually at the first regularly scheduled board meeting held in January. Therefore, the officers so elected shall serve a one-year term or until their successors are elected and duly qualified. At this time, I will call for nominations for, from the board for chairperson to serve a one-year term. Is there a motion? Board Member Pastor Shul. I make the motion to nominate Chairwoman Diane Porter to continue thank, as chair. Thank you. Is there a second? I second that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Dun Duncan, very much. Uh, all the nominations have been made, and at this time I will close the nominations. I will call for a vote on the candidate nominated by a show of hands. The votes will be taken in the order in which the candidates were nominated. So at this time we will go on and do the chairperson and then we will come back and do the vice chairperson. Um, all those in favor of um, the chairperson being Diane Porter, would you please raise your hand? <laughs> it's a little awkward. Uh, it's, it seems to be unanimous, so thank you very much. Also at this time we will move on to um, the election of the vice chairman. Is there a nomination for the office of vice chairman? Board member Craig? I nominate Dr. Chris Call to continue as vice chair. Okay, is there a second to the motion? Uh, Pastor Shule, um, are there any other nominations? If not, I will close the nominations and at this time we will call for a vote for uh, our vice chair. By doing so, I would ask you to please raise your hands for vice chair, Dr. Chris Cobb. It's unanimous, thank you very much. We have selected our chair and vice chair for year 2020. Thank you as we move forward. Uh, before we do uh, resolutions, since y'all didn't let me talk earlier, <laughs> I've got a few brief comments to make. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the board for the opportunity to serve as the chairwoman this year. It is an honor and I appreciate your support and look forward to the important work we must do for our students. 
I would like to recognize my colleagues and share some of the work that they do away from our board meetings, whether they've done it in the past or right now. So representing District uh, 2 is Dr. Chris Cobb. Representing District 3 is James Craig. Representing District 4 is Joe Marshall. Representing District 5, Linda Duncan. District 6 is Pastor Corey Shull. District 7 is Chris Brady. Some of the activities that our board members have done, done in the past and are currently doing uh, served on the KSBA Board of Directors, KSBA Advocacy Committee, Chair and Co-Chair of Policy and Revenue Task Force Committees, members of Ev member of Evolve 502 Operating Committee, and a member of the Kentucky Education Transition Team. I would also like to thank Superintendent Polio and all employees of this district who work tirelessly to provide quality education, compassion, and support for our students, staff, and families. On January 3rd, I attended the closing event for hip hop and literacy at the California Community Center. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Vanessa McVale for inviting me and her team from Diversity, Equity, and Poverty for the, uh, providing this event for our students during the holiday break. While they're hip hopping, I heard a song that was not totally hip hop and I wanted to share some of the words from the song because it is the message that I think we stand for every day. The song starts, I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them the beauty that they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us of how we used to be. Every child is searching for a hero. Our youth need someone to look up to. Um, I, would, I think that fits the work that we do on a daily basis. January is Celebration Month honoring the birthdays of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. January the 15th and Muhammad Ali on January the 17th. A few quotes from Dr. King, character plus intelligence, that's the true goal of education. Life's most persistent and urgent question is what are you doing for others? Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Our children matter. Quote from Muhammad Ali, don't count the days, make every day count. As we embark on a new year, we must aggressively continue the work of educating our children. I ask for your help and support for this board, from the community, from everyone that cares about educating our children. Working together, we can make a significant difference for JCPS education. Thank you very much. Moving on, we will now go on to the recognitions and resolutions. And it's my honor to introduce Tony Kahn's Tapman. Welcome, thank you, Ms. Tony. Good evening, Dr. Polio, Board Chair Diane Porter, and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education. This evening, we have the honor of recognizing the outstanding accomplishments of several teachers, students, district staff, and our schools. We begin tonight recognizing Mazik Middle School student Audrey Bruce for winning the Team Kentucky Inauguration Poster Contest. Students ages 6 to 17 were asked to create art showcasing Kentuckians working together to accomplish common goals. A winner was selected for age groups 6 through 9, 10 through 13, and 14 through 17 by a panel that included Kentucky First Lady Brittany Bashir. Two overall winners were selected, one for having the most colorful poster and one for having the most creative poster. Audrey won for having the, most, or having the overall most creative poster. It was entitled, If Kentucky Worked Together. The winners and their families were invited to attend the inauguration celebration at the Capitol. They also had their artwork displayed at the Capitol during the event. And Dr. Polio, Board Chair Diane Porter, Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools Michelle Dillard, please come forward to extend our congratulations to Audrey and joining in the recognition is her principal, Rhonda George.
And if Audrey's parents or family are in the audience, if her parents or family in the audience, please stand to be recognized. Next, we have the privilege of honoring the JCPS Safe Crisis Management Team for being recognized as a model for the best practice in Kentucky. Our Safe Crisis Management Team and their work, led by Coordinator B.J. Ritter, was recognized at the Kentucky Department of Education's Continuous Improvement Summit last fall as being a model for best practice for our state. The mission of this team is to provide professional training to our employees based on an uncompromising respect for the dignity of all and a recognition that best practice training contributes to safety, positive growth, and improved performance. Mr. Ritter and this team facilitate more than 300 trainings annually to JCPS staff. In addition, they provide ongoing trainings to administrators on district policies and procedures, de-escalation trainings to all in-school security monitors, bus drivers, and cl in-school classroom monitors, as well as early childhood staff. In addition to being recognized as being a model for best practice, the team received a $1,000 check that can be used towards school improvement and is highlighted on the Department of Education's Best Practices website. Dr. Polio, Board Chair Diane Porter, and Assistant Superintendent for Climate and Culture, Dr. Katie DeFieri, please come forward to extend our appreciation to Mr. Ritter, David Hoon, Candace Crawford Morrison, and Crystal Bowling. Next, we have the privilege of honoring 33 district educators who have obtained National Board Certification in 2019. National Board Certification is the highest professional credential in the field of teaching. It ensures that teachers have the knowledge and skills to advance in student learning. The road to becoming nationally board certific certified teachers is very difficult. The process involves hundreds of hours of work and can take up to three years of commitment. Teachers earn national board certification by demonstrating their knowledge and teaching skills through an extensive, rigorous certification process. This process cons consists of four components, which include written assessment of content knowledge, student work samples, video and analysis of teaching practice, and accomplishments as a teaching professional. We will honor each of these newly board certified teachers by board district, beginning with board chair Diane Porter. When I call your name, come forward, please, to have your picture taken. We'll start with Laquita Carter. She's an acceleration inst instructional coach, and joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent Paige Hartstern. Next, we have, sorry, Bick Elementary School teacher, Sarah Hanna. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent, Nate Meyer, and her principal, Carla Colliday. DuPont Manual High School teacher Aaron Morris, and joining him in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent of High Schools Christy Rogers and his principal Daryl Farmer.
Portland Elementary School teacher, Ann Sanders. And joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools, Joe Leffert, and her principal, Michelle Perkins. No middle school teacher, Molly Sullivan. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent, Michelle Dillard, and her principal, Jennifer Cave. And that is it for District 1. Um, I will say, Board Member Kolb, you do have one in your district, and it's Atherton High School teacher Victoria Atkins, but she was unable to be here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so we will make sure that she receives her certificate. Um, Board Member um, James Craig, if you can join us up at front. Middletown Elementary teacher Jennifer Chester. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools, Joe Leffert, and her principal, Justin Matson. <laughs> Westport Middle School teacher, Alice Now. Joining in her in recognition is Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, Michelle Dillard, and her principal, Jody Zeller. Westport Middle School teacher Stacy Hubbard joining her in the recognition, Michelle Dillard and Jody Zeller. Wilder Elementary School teacher Joni Heights joining in her recognition is Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools uh, Joe Leffert and her principal Bill Perkins. And then we have two other teachers from this district, Eastern High School teachers, Emily McKeon and Jeremy Thompson. They were unable to turn uh, to come tonight, and we will make sure that they receive their certificates. Uh, board member Joe Marshall, if you can join us, please. Frost, sixth grade academy teacher, Mary Hole. Joining in her recognition is assistant superintendent, Nate Meyer, and her principal, Faith Stroud. <clears throat> Barnsley Middle School teacher Jim Leonard, joining him in the recognition as Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, Michelle Dillard, and his principal, Linda Hudson.
Trunnell Elementary School teacher, Nancy O'Donohue, joining in her recognition as Assistant Superintendent, Nate Meyer, and her principal, Stephanie Smith. And that is it from District 4. Board member Linda Duncan, if you can join us at the front. Auburndale Elementary School teacher Erin Dunlap. Joining her in the recognition, Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools Brad Weston. And her principal, if she was able to make it, Katanya Parker. We do have one more from Auburndale. It was Amanda Evans, but she was not able to make it tonight. We'll make sure she receives her um, certificate. But hold on, Ms. Duncan, we have a couple more from uh, your district. <laughs> um, Catherine Grant, a teacher at Lasseter Middle School, joining in her recognition as Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, Michelle Dillard, and her principal, John Sessler. Marcy Rogers from Lassiter Middle School uh, was not able to join us. We'll make sure she receives her certificate. Uh, Southern High School teacher, Norrell Hodge. No, she made it yet? No, she did not. Semple Elementary resource teacher, Brittany Veach. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent, Paige Hartstern, and her principal, Danielle Randall. Board member Scholl, if you can join us at the front. Slaughter Elementary School counselor Stephanie Belcher, joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent Paige Hartstern and her principal Stacy Rowan. Slaughter Elementary School teacher Jennifer Waits, and joining her in the recognition is uh, Assistant Superintendent Paige Hartstern and her principal, Stacy Rowan. We have a third one from Slaughter. This is, uh, Slaughter had the most this year, by the way. <laughs> Samuel Storm, he was not able to make it because I have heard his wife um, just had a baby. So we will make sure he gets his certificate. Price Elementary School Library Media Specialist, uh, or right, yeah, she was not able to make it easier. So here easy, so we'll make sure she gets her certificate as well. Newburgh Middle School teacher, Cassandra Shoemaker. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent Nate Meyer and her principal, Nicole Adele. Louisville Male High School teacher Molly Siegel, 
Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent of High Schools, Christy Rogers, and her principal, Willie Foster. Rangeland Elementary School teacher Tiffany Thieneman. Joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent Nate Meyer and her principal Michelle Kiggins. And board member Brady, if you can join us up at the front. Fern Creek High School teacher Courtney Williams, joining her in the recognition is Assistant Superintendent of High Schools, Christy Rogers, and her principal, Rebecca Nicholas. We have another one from Fern Creek, Marcus Blakeney, but he was not able to make it tonight. We will make sure he receives a certificate. I just want to make sure Jefferson Town High School teacher Jessica Clem, is she here? Okay. She um, is also unable to make it, and we will make sure she receives um, her certificate. Ramsey Middle School teacher Catherine Hubbard, joining in her recognition is Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools Michelle Dillard and her principal, Dr. Tara Greenwell. Bates Elementary School teacher Rachel Rich, joining in her recognition as Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools Paige Hertstern and her principal Alicia Dunn. This group of National Board Certified Teachers is the largest group that we have had in several years. I would like to ask the families of these teachers to please stand to be recognized because we know that without your support, their dedication to our students would not be possible. Up next, we have the honor of recognizing W.E.B. Du Bois Academy teacher Jessica Duenas for showing compassion and being a champion of the district's core values. Jessica was named the 2019 Kentucky Teacher of the Year, an award that comes with a sabbatical for half of the school year. She had won the award while she was still teaching in Oldham County, but had already accepted a job offer at the W.E.B. Du Bois Academy and was so excited to serve the school in its inaugural year that she didn't want to leave her students. She asked the Kentucky Department of Education if she could work the full year and receive money for working the entire school year, and they graciously said yes. She knew she wanted to use the money to fund a class trip to Washington, D.C. The $20,000 wasn't enough to fund a trip for all 150 of the students in that inaugural class. 
So to make it fair, the school hosted a raffle with each student's name with 28 students picked at random to make the trip. Since then, community members and others have donated in an effort to have all 150 boys, now seventh graders, make the trip this April. Here's a short video about why Jessica is so passionate about her work. Hi, I'm Jessica Duenas and I am the ECE Language Arts Resource Teacher at the WEB Du Bois Academy. My job is to deliver specially designed instruction to students with different special needs. When I saw that Du Bois Academy was going to feature a curriculum that featured young men who look like my father, I really wanted to serve that purpose. We're one of five schools in the nation serving this mission and this purpose. There is no way that I could not be a part of this. It's historic. It's worth the effort. It's worth the lack of sleep. I love it. It's my passion. I'm made for this. I spent a lot of time just thinking about how can I make the next day better. I'm constantly changing things up. We were challenged by Mr. Gunn to do things completely differently from how we ever taught previously. I love my students. They are just sweethearts. They're quirky. They're awesome, loving. We've got to change these young men's lives for the better. And I think it's just the whole purpose that we serve here, that we are meeting their needs on every level and we're working really hard, we're engaging them. It makes me so, so happy anytime that they have any kind of game. You know, I celebrate it, I name it, I claim it, I tell them to claim it, I'll call home. It's always a celebration. Any game is a positive movement in my room. They, they're learning and I think it shows and that's, I'm proud of them for that. I am Jessica Duenas and I am JCPS. We are, we are fortunate in JCPS to have thousands of wonderful teachers like Ms. Duenas who go above and beyond each and every day for our students. She is a true champion of our district's core values. Dr. Polio, all of our board members, Chief Equity Officer John Marshall, Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools Michelle Dillard, Please come forward to extend our appreciation to Jessica and joining in the recognition as her principal, Mr. Gunn. In addition, I understand that several of her family members flew in for this recognition, including her mom and sister from Costa Rica and another sister from Tampa. Please join us for a group photo. And I see that several of her students are here, so if they'd like to stand to be recognized, we'd love to see them. Up next, we have the privilege of recognizing some Iroquois High School students whose recipes were recently published in a special edition of Envision Equity. Iroquois is home to 411 English as a second language students who represent 37 countries and speak 27 languages. 17 of these students recently participated in a cultural cookbook project as part of their class that was then published in an Envision Equity publication by the district's Diversity, Equity, and Poverty Programs Division. Food is an important part of culture, and many of their happiest moments of family and celebration center around the dishes that they serve. The recipes shared in this cookbook are cherished representations of homeland, fam family, and comfort for our students. Each student also wrote personal essays that are included with each of the recipes that are first-person narratives as to how their lives have changed since coming to America and how they will contribute to their community. Take Najwa, for example. She is from Sudan and rarely attended school because she had a hard time understanding Arabic and her teachers would often beat her. In America, she says, she is free and her teachers 
don't beat her, and she loves her ch the chance to have an education. She also loves being around so many people with different cultures, religions, and backgrounds. She wants to contribute to her community by finding a way to build more hospitals in her home country because hospitals are too far away and many people can't reach them. We have four other students who are featured in this cookbook and I would like to invite them up to the front along with Dr. Polio, board member Linda Duncan, Chief Equity Officer John Marshall, I'm not sure if Giselle Danger is here, but if she is, to come forward, as well as Assistant Superintendent Nate Meyer. Please come forward to extend our congratulations to these students, and joining them in their recognition is their principal, Rob Folk, as well as their teacher who coordinated this project, Kim Courtney. Up next, we have the privilege of honoring you, the Jefferson County Board of Education, and observance of National, Board, National School Board Recognition Month. JCPS joins 172 of Kentucky's public school districts to mark the state's ob observance of January as National School Board Recognition Month. This is a time for students, parents, staff, and the community to join together to honor the outstanding leadership, dedication, and contributions of our school board members. Members of the Jefferson County Board of Education work collaboratively with businesses, organizations, parents, and community members to offer schools programs that enhance the educational experience of all children and move students to a higher level. Board members work tirelessly to ensure a successful learning environment and prepare all JCPS students to graduate college and career ready. They are committed to meet the diverse educational needs of all students and to empower them to become competent, productive co contributors to a democratic society in an ever-changing world. They are also visionaries and advocates who work diligently to provide unique learning opportunities in, inside and outside of the classroom for our students. They are champions who devote themselves to making a better tomorrow by ensuring a successful education for all. And they are advocates who empower our students and encourage parents and the community to continually be involved in helping guarantee a great future for our children who are our future leaders. Dr. Polio, please come up and join our board for um, a, a group photo along with these certificates for each of our board members. We have one final recognition tonight and the man being recognized does not know it. We'd like to add a special recognition to Aaron Borden. Aaron has been the man behind the camera at these board meetings and many other events for the past four years. 
whether it was capturing the first day of school, the last day of school, and everything in between, we are very appreciative for your service to our students and our schools, as tonight is Aaron's last board meeting and event for our school district. Dr. Polio, Chief Communications Officer, Renee Murphy, and all members of the board, please come forward as we recognize Aaron. And there should be a slide right after this one, hopefully. There we go. Okay, I have kept you all long enough. This concludes our recognitions for this evening. I appreciate the extra time. Uh, we truly had a lot to celebrate tonight, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony, very much. Uh, before you get to leave, hold on, hold on, hold on. Just a second. You're on your way out, I promise. Before they do that, um, is there a motion to receive the recognitions? Board Member Craig, second by Board Member Brady, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Now, before you walk out the door, we have applauded and recognized some great people this evening, and this is the time when you get to leave, just before the superintendent's speech. But what I would like for us really to do is we can do better than any clapping we've done thus far. We all need to stand up and recognize all the recognitions for this evening. Thank you. Now you have about 30 seconds to clear the room. <laughs> Be safe. That. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. A recommendation for the approval of minutes of the previous meeting. There's a motion to approve the minutes of December the 10th and the 17th meetings. Is there a motion? Board Member Craig, seconded by Dr. Chris. All those in favor? It's unanimous uh, from all board members. Thank you very much. At this time, as we uh, start our new year, 2020, it's my pleasure to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Marty Polio, for the superintendent's report. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Tonight, I bring you the report for January 14th, 2020. Um, at our last board meeting, I discussed how 2020 was going to bring a lot of changes to JCPS. Um, we've talked a lot, as we did in the work session, about how many of these changes have been needed for years. So as we begin the new year, I think it's a good time to give an update publicly on where we are in progressing in these major changes that could come to you all um, during this current school year. So first of all, student assignment. As you know, we held a work session uh, this afternoon, this early this evening on student assignment with the board. Um, we have the, the task forces develop recommendations around a dual resides plan for our approximate 6,500 middle and high school students. Um, in which a large percentage of the students in um, these satellite areas leave their community every day to attend a school that is not their choice. Um, and we are working to change that, which may require the building of new schools. Also, we have a lot of work around magnets that we are working on, recommendations about increasing magnets, centralizing um, the lotteries of magnets, um, also eliminating exits. Um, from um, our uh, magnet process. We've hired a consultant who will develop specifics around the plan and bring them back to you. We'll finalize those recommendations and bring back to you uh, final recommendations at a work session and eventually a vote this spring. The Revenue Task Force. We've worked diligently over the past six week period to study all factors surrounding the need for additional revenue and those options for the Board of Education. At our board retreat in two weeks, we will have a work session that we will detail those op options and any recommendations to the board on potential revenue, additional revenue sources. As we've said before, we have the lowest tax rate of any district in this entire area. And I think it's important that we thoroughly explore all revenue options in order to better support our children and our facilities. After that work session, we will continue to explore these recommendations and possibly bring you a pro final proposal for vote in April or May. With school security officers, you know we held a policy committee meeting last night to take a look at proposed policy, creating a school security officer division within operations. Next Tuesday, we will have, um, once again, a second meeting where we will look at st uh, potential standard operating procedures. 
At our board retreat as well, we will hold another work session to provide the board with policies, procedures, org chart changes, job descriptions for your feedback. And after that work session, we will then plan when we will bring those recommendations for their final approval at either the February or the March board business meeting, depending on your uh, input. Teacher development and principal pipeline. We fully developed the teacher residency program. Look forward to implementation in the fall. We plan to have 30 teacher residents who will be working uh, with our master teacher in the classroom Monday through Thursday, and will be attending class at UofL on Fridays. Um, residents will become certified in one year. We appreciate that partnership with the University of Louisville with our teacher residency program. Um, and we believe that the intent of this will be not only to fill every, every classroom, but also to increase our teachers of color um, that are teaching in our schools. We are finalizing plans for a principal pipeline program and partnering with the Wallace Foundation and hope to have that fully implemented in the fall. Facilities and new schools will be holding community forums in the coming weeks on both the Echo Trail property and the West Broadway property that's adjacent to the new Y. Um, in, on West Broadway and our architects are currently working on plans for those new schools. Uh, we plan to break ground on our four new schools this spring and we're cur currently exploring options to consolidate our central office buildings into one building in order to save money that we can repurpose back to schools. And then we're also working on developing a long-term or a 10-year plan uh, for facilities improvement. Finally, with our corrective action plan, we have 275 actions that we've been charged to improve in 10 different areas from the Kentucky Department of, of Education about a year and a half ago. Proud to report we're at 83% of those items um, that we feel we have successfully established. For the first time in several years, we were also able to close out some items on our IDEA corrective action plan. So we feel we're moving forward and we're confident that we will fully be prepared for the audit of 2020 uh, that we believe will take place in October. So as you can see these and many other things, we've got a lot on our plate in the coming months um, when it comes to board votes, um, input, and the work that we'll be doing in order to get to our desired state. As I conclude, um, I would like to report I was excited to meet with Governor Bashir today at the Capitol. As we speak, I believe he is giving the State of the Commonwealth Address, and it's very clear in our discussion, and I'm sure in his speech tonight, that he's fully supportive of our work in JCPS and supporting public education and educators across the state. I'm excited and privileged to partner with him, his staff, and KDE as we move forward in all of these uh, great plans that we have to change JCPS. Um, thank you, and that concludes the superintendent report. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Give them a round of applause if you like. <laughs> it's all good. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. That's a first. It's a new year. So at this time, we're going to move on to uh, persons requesting to address the board. And we currently have 10 speakers on non-agenda items. So there's a document that I have to read, and then we will start with the 10 speakers for the evening. In accordance with board policy 01.421, the board expects that persons who have signed up to address the board will limit their remarks to the subject that they have listed at the time they signed up, that their presentation will not include any abusive remarks about that subject, and that they will present their remarks in a manner that is consistent with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Also, in accordance with board policy, the board reserves the right to limit, extend, or terminate discussion on any subject. Discussion of personnel matters is not permitted as the board has no legal authority regarding such matters and such, dis such discussion is not appropriate. Personnel matters are within the authority of the superintendent. If a speaker begins to discuss the personnel matter, the chair shall immediately terminate the speaker's remarks. A speaker may not initiate charges or complaints against an individual district employee. Discussion of a district employee by name or position is not p permitted in order to ensure confidentiality and fairness for the employee. If a person discusses a district employee by name or position in their remarks to the board, the chair shall immediately terminate the speaker's remarks. Speakers before the entire board are not allowed to use props, displays, or other objects during the presentation. However, informational handouts may be given to the assistant secretary to the board for distribution prior to or following the meeting, and she is there. That's Angie, if you have anything to give us, please. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board and may not share these minutes with any other speaker. 
At the end of two and a half minutes, a bell will sound once. You will then have 30 seconds to finish your statement. At the end of three minutes, the bell will sound twice, indicating that your time is up. The superintendent will look into the speaker's issues and, if necessary, represent the board in following up or recommend action to the board. Board Policy 01.45 establishes that persons speaking regarding items on board agenda shall be permitted to do so prior to persons speaking regarding non-agenda items. A maximum of 45 minutes shall be allocated for speakers immediately after the superintendent's report. Speakers who are unable to be accommodated due to that, to, due to that time limitation may address the board later in the meeting immediately after the board reports. This full board policy concerning public participation and open meetings is available for viewing on our website and at our sign-in sheet. It is my pleasure this evening to introduce our first speaker. Ms. Michelle Wade is going to speak to us about school safety. Ms. Wade, welcome. It doesn't matter. Uh, hello, my name is Michelle Way. Um, I represent some community groups and um, concerned citizens and taxpayers. Um, I'm here tonight about the school safety program and the SRO program. Um, since I only have three minutes, I have emailed my full uh, presentation to all of you. Um, I have three key points I wanted to talk about. One is, in reading Senate Bill 1, it uh, requires an increase of SROs and counselors. Senate Bill 8 requires at least one armed SOR per campus. The removal of armed and uniformed SROs to appease anxieties of one group of students negates the potential creation of anxieties in other students or faculty. Once those SROs are removed, it also removes the opportunity of creating positive experiences. If you remove the SROs that these children are saying are causing them anxiety, then they have no way of creating a positive experience. Um, and you have additional counselors now to facilitate those positive experiences. The tie vote that happened last August that caused the cancellation of the contracts um, was very concerning for the simple fact that it negated the one piece of data and research which I think was most important to JCPS and that was the report from Dr. Polio that 75%, which I think was later reported to be 90%, of the principals in the middle and high schools wanted the SROs. Um, it also gives a lack of consideration um, to incidents that can't be measured. And those incidents are the ones that were prevented because the SROs were present as a deterrent. Um, as of today, JCPS has went 89 days without a fully functional SRO program, leaving a handful of SROs to respond to over 400 incidents. While the board discusses the policies and procedures they want to put in place, under the protection of armed security, our students and faculty are in an environment where they have now uh, areas of uncertainty and fear. Ms. Wade, thank you for being here this evening. And I believe, I know I received your email, so I'm sure the other board members did as well. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the um, board members that responded to my email in December. Um, Mr. Marshall, Mrs. Duncan, and Mrs. Porter. Thank you so much for thank you. the time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker is Marina Gonzalez. I probably messed that up again, sorry. How about Miss Marina? And she's gonna speak on student assignment. Welcome. <coughs>
forgive me because I'm run reading from multiple pages. Um, I wrote two different speeches and then came in here and listened to your work session and redid all of it. So I plan to provide a copy to um, the Assistant Secretary so that she can provide that to all of you and have it in the minutes. Um, hello again, Chair Porter, Dr. Polio, and distinguished members of the Board of Education. My name is Marina Gonzalez. <laughs> And I was here on December 10th, along with several others, to speak about the proposed change to the exit policy for magnet schools as part of the student assignment changes being considered. To refresh your memory, I am opposed to the recommended change to eliminate school-initiated exits at magnet schools, and more specifically in our traditional schools and programs, which have served tens of thousands of students very well for the last 44 years. The Magnet Schools of America MSA review that was completed in 2014 suggests that traditional programs in schools may be detrimental to the diversity goals of the district. However, more recent data suggests otherwise. In 2018-19 school year, enrollment in the nine traditional schools was 51% 50 white and 49% non-white. Where are we at now? Okay. In a recent CJ article uh, showing data from three traditional schools, um, Butler, Johnson, and JCTMS specifically, um, the data indicated that they exited 4% of their enrollment last year. That 4% equates to 138 students across those three schools who do not get to choose. Remember, those schools do not get to choose their students in advance because of the lottery process. There is no specific criteria to be able to attend a traditional magnet school. That's 0.5% of the 25,000 students that are part of the magnet program today. Not to mention, we don't know how many of those school-initiated exits were held up considering parents have access to an appeals process through the Office of Options and Magnets, which often will send the student back to the school with a performance improvement plan in place for the next semester or school year. I could go on, honestly, um, but I'm limited on time. I did want to note, I echo board member Brady's comments um, that admission practices, including common application and centralized lottery, should take a higher priority than an exit policy that affects 1.4% of our magnet students across the district. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here this evening. Our next speaker is Autumn Nagley. Ms. Autumn, welcome, and she's gonna talk to us about student assignment. Good evening, and thank you for letting me speak to you today. Um, I'm here to speak about student assignment and family engagement. And I, like the previous speaker, had to do some re-editing on my uh, speech after the work session. I do support students having a choice where do they attend school. I think every child should have an opportunity to attend a quality school in their neighborhood, too. Families choosing a school across the district is by far the greatest choice they can have. But a family being able to choose a school in their neighborhood is something that I think is, should be a right. Studies to show that engaged families are the success, key to successful students and successful schools. But when you're across the district, that makes it very hard for families that do not have transportation or some of the other things that families that in their own neighborhood could do. Um, I do wanna thank the Student Assignment Committee for the proposals and for getting community feedback. I think they did a great job of reaching out to people. However, I don't always think that the information was accurately presented to families. I've attended many of these feedback sessions, and I, it was the first time that I heard it clearly stated that in order to do a dual reside, that you're gonna have to build a school. I was ecstatic that I actually heard that come out in front of everybody. I've heard it in little pieces here and there, but to the entire group, I was at the PAC one, I was at, I came late to the um, one at uh, the Urban League, but it's never been out there in front to say that you have to build a school in order to do this. My biggest issue with the dual reside is it's not a true option right now. I feel that families have been sold a bill of goods that don't exist. When the truth is, without a school or several schools being built, we cannot offer the students in the West End the same option that the rest of the JCPS students have. I've read through the feedback and very few people recognize this. There is no open schools for our students to attend if they decide to go in their neighborhood. 
Now you could do one option and you could change the schools that are already in our neighborhood. For example, Western could no longer be a magnet and you could get reside students in there, but no one has suggested that or changing Central, that is the high school that's closest. Those are both great schools. I graduated from Central, so I, I know for a fact. <laughs> but those schools, no one's has suggested changing those. Um, the second option is to build schools. But we know that takes time. You can't snap a finger and have schools. And so to put the student assignment out there to be um, accepted, parents are thinking that the next time that their students go to put that application process in, they're gonna be able to choose that dual reside. And that is not an option as we heard earlier, as we know that we can't automatically snap our fingers. It also comes down to a basic fear, a pipe dream, like so many of the West Ends get from the city. While JCPS has had nothing to do, the failed broken promises of Walmart, food port, or even passport, we remember promises that have not happened. Our children cannot wait years for us to put them first. We need to find a way to make this option a promise immediately and not wait for a building to be built. I can share the numbers and data that show that our students are not thriving being a set across the district, but in fact falling behind. We need, we cannot let more students and families be left behind. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. Our next speaker is Ashley Hennan. Ashley Hennan. One more time for Ms. Ashley. Our next speaker is Theresa Abron. Theresa Abron. Our next speaker is Gay Edelman, and her topic is, Are You Listening to Stakeholders? Welcome, Ms. Edelman. Thank you. Dear JCPS, the topic of my speech is listen to stakeholders. The longer version is listen to the stakeholders that are most affected by our policies. Um, they've been telling you uh, the things that need to change in our district. Um, we need to listen to parents of color. We need to listen to mothers of color. Uh, there was a video that just recently went viral last week of a parent at one of our elementary schools that is the same elementary school that speakers came and spoke to you last year in the fall, I mean, sorry, in the spring of May about an election at, at their school that had taken place that was uh, manipulated by administration. Uh, these, these parents have been telling you about in, uh, uh, bias that exists in their schools, and we need to listen to them. Um, these are the same parents that have been shut out of PTAs and site-based decision-making councils. They are the parents that are concerned about their students uh, with uh, pr police presence in their schools. Uh, they are affected by the student assignment plan the most. We need to listen to them. We also need to listen to, to black educators. Uh, in your folder, the, in addition to the sheets that I gave to Angie, you each have a manila folder in front of you with some samples of another elementary school uh, in our district that uh, a, t a, a staff member has been targeted for simply bringing up uh, and trying to educate her school community about bias that exists. And instead of uh, listening to her concerns, she's been targeted and experienced retribution. So there is a copy of, of her response in your folder. Um, it's clear that the groups that, are, that exist in order to represent these stakeholders have not been speaking up for this most marginalized community, so we have to be intentional uh, and, and make space for them. We need to listen to our, uh, our maintenance employees. There's a class action lawsuit right now, and our maintenance workers have uh, conveyed that based on the color of their skin, they're not being promoted as quickly as, as uh, other coworkers, and uh, many of them still bear the title helper 
I'm sorry, but that is an offensive title um, for somebody that's been in a career for as long as many of these maintenance workers have. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a rumor that there's a blacklist in HR, for example, too. We have to uh, remove these barriers and make space for, for equity across the district and listening to our, uh, our families, our stakeholders of color in particular, because they are closest to the pain, as G2 Brown says. Our students, many of our students came here last year and spoke to you about a, a principal who had made some derogatory comments. And fortunately, um, the district did address that, but my understanding is there's still things taking place in that school. So please look at your folder and be aware of that as well. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here this evening. Thank Our you. next speaker is Brayden O'Bannon. Brayden O'Bannon, who wants to talk to us about school field trip. Welcome, Brayden, and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brayden O'Bannon. Yesterday, I handed Mr. Polio a letter concerning a field trip. I was invited back to share this idea with you tonight. I would like to read it to you now. Um, I am a student at the J. Graham Brown School, and I would like to request that all middle and high school students in Jefferson County Public Schools be allowed to view the film Just Mercy. I recently went to see the movie, and I believe that the middle and high school students would benefit from seeing this movie. It shows the effects of racism. This movie also shows how poverty can affect people and how they respond differently depending on the racial and economic status that the community has given them. This also shows how a biased and unjust system can be changed. For me, it gave me a much deeper learning experience than I have ever received from textbooks or lectures from teachers. It showed me truly what unmerciful and unfair judgment is. This movie also showed how perseverance can lead to a better outcome. Please give this request serious thought and consideration. Yesterday, I took Mr. Marshall's suggestion about submitting my request to the principal and counselor at my school so that there could possibly be possibly be a snowball effect between other schools. But when I went to request the time to speak with the principal, one of the clerical personnel told me that my request should include a solution to the issues of cost and transportation before I present my statement to a community of people my age. I ensure that someone has a better insight on how to solve the problem of transportation for my time. Have a good evening. Thank you, Brayden, for being here this evening. Good job. Our next speaker is Kenya Jennings. Kenya Jennings, and the topic is security. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kenya Jennings. I'm just going to... Um, basically go over what me and my sons are going through after the um, situation at Iroquois. Uh, Cameron is still having a hard time as far as getting back into school on a regular system, trusting teachers. He knows that not everyone is out to get him, so to say, but because of how the situation was handled, he's having a hard time confiding and teachers that necessarily don't really, can't really relate to what he's going through. Uh, I also have a 16-year-old son who's looking at the situation of what his brother has went through and how the situation was handled, and he's having a hard time trusting teachers and any kind of security personnel. And I've spoke to them about the, the SROs, and they are not, they don't agree with them. They don't feel like having an officer, an armed officer in their school is going to protect them from any incidents. They feel like a, a, the officer is going to already have a mind frame of it's white against black and brown, basically. And I'm trying to... What I really want is just somewhere where they can, they'll be safe at school, but they have the option to go and talk to a counselor or get some, some kind of like a mediation area where if something happens and they just need to have a cool off moment. I feel like also the teachers should have some kind of 
disciplinary training. The teacher that um, had the incident with Cameron, assaulted Cameron, she is basically off just living her life. She's fine, and then she's quit, and my son still has to go through the situation every day. He lives it every day when he goes to school, when a new student is transferring into the school, when a teacher is coming in. They already looking at him. They already looking at him and have a mad frame of my son is a monster, and he's not. He felt like in that time frame of when the situation happened, he had to defend himself. And I just feel like teachers would take the training more seriously or give them something that they can use besides putting their hands on our babies. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. Our next speaker is Chanel Helm. Chanel Helm is going to talk to us about SROs. Welcome. Thank you. Hey, y'all. It's been a minute, but technically my daughter's supposed to be in bed 21 minutes ago, right? And this meeting takes so long. Um, I want to express um, how disappointed I am that there's an acceptance of having a security force at an educational um, institution. When we're talking about what is going on with Kenya, um, what um, someone else came up here to say, we need to address exactly what it is. Um, I applaud, you know, starting the racial equity um, task force and now this committee and it's working, but I'm a movement organizer. And if something goes down that just went down just now, a young 16 year old boy went to go see his um, brother at the hospital. He got shot in the head, he's there. He got hit up by the police. I have to go into motion right away and I have to know what to do. And if anybody is panicking, I have to go into another set of behavior so that I can make sure that no one else gets hurt. That's a training that all movement organizers have. Do we get a certificate? Do we get an award, a little glass jar or whatever, vacation time? No, we don't. We have to prepare and know that any moment, at any time, here in this room or outside of here that I would have to do that again. We expect everybody that is at JCPS, inside these schools, inside school communities, actual communities, organized communities, to be able to go into motion at any time. What happened to Cameron, what is happening to several students right now, several parents couldn't make it here tonight, and what is taking place around um, the narrative of wanting SROs is really troubling to me. I'm gonna send you what um, Advancement Project just sent to us again. We just had a meeting in December. We are formulating our bi-national campaign. Um, and we are doubling down on police-free schools. It's enough. It really is. It's tiring. Um, Kenya just went through the criminal justice system for the first time in her life for her son. That's scary. It's also very racist. The entire system and its entire makeup of policing is extremely racist. These children need to leave their homes, homes they may not even return to that evening from policing neighborhoods to go to school where they will be policed. What does that feel like? Have you ever been judged and unjudged unfairly and continually day in and day out? That creates a type of trauma. Kentucky has the most traumatized kids in the state, in the nation. That's what we're sitting with. We have a lot of trauma-sensitive schools and things like that, and a lot of these children are children. They can't mold their behavior due to a situation. They can't act the way that I can act and be trained in the way that I can, but adults can. And our schools are filled with them. And they should be given the talents and the training to do that instead of fearing children. Three-fifths of our children are black that are arrested out of 276 students last year, 2017-2018. They were black. That's what we fear. That's a fear I have on my seven-year-old son every day that I send him to King Elementary. Every day. I shouldn't have to fear whether my child is coming home or not when I send him to school. It's not a, a group of people who fear that. We entered the school buildings in the 50s with police officers, with National Guard, with the Army. They are still there. We are still going to prison. 
It doesn't end well for us. And now we have a legislator out in the middle of Kentucky somewhere urging the only school district to arm police officers that they do not have. That is racism. And we need to address that and call it for what it is. And so I'm asking you to make the bold decision. And that decision is to either cancel this security force and look at the beautiful ways that we can train our adults, that we can help our children learn to live together and mold communities that are safe, not build security forces. It's not what I send my children to go to school for. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. Uh, our last speaker is Rita Ward, and she's speaking about security. Rita Ward, welcome, Ms. Ward. Yes, please. Good evening, board, Superintendent Polio. Um, my name is Rita Ward. I'm a local attorney, and I do education advocacy. And I want to talk about police officers in school. Sometimes when I think about police officers in school and talking about it, it feels like a conversation about climate change. It doesn't matter what the, what the research says, people are going to believe what they believe, right? Anyway, so I was reading an article recently that, that uh, the author stated that in the years since the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida that killed 17 people and wounded five, the reaction by both state and federal legislatures has largely followed the pattern of, of past mass shootings increased spending on policing and security equipment in schools that research shows does not make students safer and that disproportionately harms non-white, disabled, and queer students. Since Parkland, there's been a lot of discussion from government entities around increasing law enforcement presence in schools, and that's unfortunate. It doesn't help students, and there are better ways to create safe environments, says Mark Schindler, the director of the Justice Policy Institute, a nonprofit that advocates for criminal justice reform. School suspensions and expulsions have increased fivefold since 1980, an increase that has come with a decades long increase in school policing. Disciplinary proceedings initiated by SROs, as with the justice system outside of schools, are implemented more harshly and more frequently with students of color. Not only are black, Latino, and low-income students punished at higher rates than their whiter and wealthier peers, but they're also more likely to be arrested. Disabled students, a 2016 American Civil Liberties Union report on California schools found, are three times more likely to be arrested than their peers. School policing is still very disproportionately harming students of color, students with learning disabilities, and the students who identified as LGBTQ, says Christopher Mallett at Cleveland State University's, whose research focuses on juvenile justice and schools. I once represented a student with autism at a JCPS high school. He left school without permission and then couldn't get back into the school and was upset. So he picked up some rocks and started throwing the rocks at the door. A police officer came up and ordered him to stop. When he didn't stop, the officer started to pull out his gun. He has autism. Luckily, an officer showed up who knew the boy and his problems and told the other officer to put his gun up. Research shows that a heavy police presence in schools actually has the effect of making kids feel less safe. The answer for JCPS student safety is not police with guns, but adults who care about them and help them learn how to create the safe environment we all desire. A school system that is already fighting disproportionality and discipline should seek to avoid additional measures that will surely increase it. Thank you, Ms. Ward, for being here this evening. That completes the speakers for this evening, so we will go back to the um, agenda items, and there are two action items. I will turn it over to Dr. Polio. Uh, the items involve 
student enrollment projections and uh, school allocation standards. But I will let Dr. Polio introduce the items. Thank, Thank you to the speakers that were here this evening. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Um, we will be providing, uh, there will be two votes tonight on action items. We will be providing one presentation as they work together. Um, one is the approval of the projected enrollments for 2021. And then the second is how we allocate based on those enrollments. Um, I will turn it over uh, to Cordelia Hardin, who will give a brief presentation, and then we'll take any questions that you have prior to the vote. Um, the enrollment projections have a direct impact on the school budget actual allocations. So that's the reason uh, we both are here to kind of go over that and how they interact with each other and the process that we use. So I'll turn it over to Brent West to talk about the, his process. Thank you. Good evening. I just want to give a brief overview um, of the process that we use to determine the enrollment projections and the timeline. So if you look at the bottom left on the first slide, this is our timeline, which also serves as a feedback loop. So when we get the first month enrollments, that's our starting point for compiling, analyzing data to start developing enrollment projections for the next year. Um, as part of that, we do room usage surveys to determine optimal capacities for the schools I'm the manager of Geographic Information Systems, GIS for short. As a newly formed department, we're compiling massive amounts of data from all different departments, um, and then we are using all of that in our GIS system to make data-driven decisions. So we, we um, involve the principals throughout this whole process. So we, the principals get to see the capacity and, the, and their projections ahead of time provide us with feedback. So we do incorporate that principal response and collaborate with the principals. As far as determining optimal build, building capacities, we use a formula that uh, we got from Austin, Texas several years back, and it was a best practice optimal capacity formula. And that, with that formula, 100% is a target for ideal building usage, but they allow a range from 75 to 115% of optimal and basically that allows schools to decide how they use their flexible space. So uh, depending on the school's needs, we work with them. We will walk buildings if need be to look at the individual needs of those schools. Um, in the middle at the bottom there, that's just a sample floor plan we brought into our system and we code all of the rooms and we have developed a dashboard on the bottom right that we use to look at historical enrollment data and then we also monitor the projections. So, we get with the principals, we bring the projections to the board. Once they're approved, we monitor the projected enrollments from now all the way up until the fifth day in August. And then we make adjustments on the fifth day. When we get the first month enrollment, that starts over. And like I said, we are compiling data from multiple sources. Um, some of those are listed on here in order to develop those projections. This is a web application, a mapping application that we developed and with this application, we are monitoring the pre-applications for development and the active building permits. So we keep this up to date. We can see trends within the county uh, to see where development is taking place, where they've actually broken ground. On this particular map, the larger the icon, the more buildable lots. And those are the pre-applications. The red dots are where they've broken ground. So you can kind of see outside of the Gene Snyder there is where we have the largest um, number of pre-applications for development. And once we received the enrollment projections in January from Brent, um, and the board obviously has to approve those uh, projections, we then apply the standard allocation formula. Now, the allocation formula does not include categorical um, or general fund add-on programs. Then in February, uh, February 25th this year, HR will actually begin reviewing the staffing decisions that the SPDMs and the school budget committees have uh, presented to us. And then uh, the next step for us is, again, we get the projections in August, the fifth day student enrollment. 
uh, plus historical trends that uh, Brent and his staff will look at. They provide us with those updated projections, and from that, we then make adjustments to the school budget uh, in staffing as well as the operational. One other uh, point as far as in August, because uh, staffing changes can be difficult for a school, we have implemented at the board's approval a one uh, point zero teacher, what we call safety net, so that if a school was to lose an allocation because of enrollment of maybe a point six in the calculation, they're held harmless, so they will continue to keep that uh, one teacher. Uh, this is just um, an showing you how the uh, summary of the allocations itself and the class size um, allocations. We go by state law as well as the JCTA contract when it comes to certified staffing. Um, individual class uh, sizes will vary at a school. It varies by grade level, specific enrollment, space usage, and SBDM decisions. This is just an example of the allocation that a school would receive. This, uh, it is on our um, website for each school to look at so they can see how we have allocated the staffing positions. And then they send back to us uh, what, how they actually want the staffing to be. And that concludes our uh, presentation. Questions? Ms. Duncan. <laughs> no, I appreciate your, your answering my question earlier, but um, Sometimes I don't know whether we, we've had changes of principles, and I don't know whether principals are all aware of the the fact that they're some of them are small class size schools, and I, I know in the case of one of my schools um, that enrollment has floated upward, and um, I don't know if there's anybody informing the principal or not that uh, those class sizes. Uh, are not supposed to be up to 28. Uh, that wasn't the original, you know, intent of, of the board on approving small class sizes for it. But, but it, do you do you make sure that the principals are aware that those class sizes are supposed to be small class sizes? Things are supposed to be observed. Every new principal receives specific training from budget, John Colopy's office, and normally uh, John is the one that's handling a lot of that, the specifics. New principals actually are required to come to a training before they have access to their budgets. They are to bring from our website, they print out these documents, they come, and the budget staff and HR actually have work sessions with them, and we have two in February already scheduled. So at that point, um, the budget staff will go over the add-on programs, which is where that class size uh, allocation will come in for an add-on. So that is reviewed with each um, principal that has that particular, or if there's another specific add-on, so they understand how it is to be used. Okay, uh, I just wanna be sure that we protect what we had built in, in those small class size schools because it makes such a huge difference when you're sitting with 20 versus 28 and, and that's what's happened in some of those classes. So I just wanna, I just hope that there's a reminder there for her in February or whoever is gonna help with that budget because I, I, I was a little <coughs> concerned when I saw the size float upward like that. Oh, thank you. Okay. Other questions? Board Member Marshall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to piggyback a little bit off Ms. Duncan's question, when there is a change in leadership at schools, uh, how are we ensuring that the information, because uh, I see in the circle it has to be approved by principals, correct? So if that principal leaves before the approval, what's the process for uh, talking to whoever's at the school at that time to still get that allocation or the enrollment projection approved? As soon as we're aware of a change, we, we will send it to the new principal and get with them on the numbers. Okay, so even if it's an interim, just somebody who's in there at the time, okay. Thank you. Other questions? 
Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, you mentioned the teacher student teacher ratios in your presentation, and you say that those are a line of JCTA contract. Uh, I thought our student teacher ratios at one point were less than what the state. You're saying what I'm hearing now is that we match up exactly what the what the state allows. But I thought at one point our student teacher ratios was less than what the state requirement was. It has been some time. If <clears throat> if there has been a difference, it's been a while since that occurred. But we have pretty much been in line with the state um, allocations, except for maybe on special education, some of those items are different. Okay. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting is on the attachments, and there's an attachment that talks about the optimal capacity and the capacity a lot of these schools are at right now. And some of these schools, and great many of the schools in my particular district and others as well, um, show that they're well over, you know, 100% capacity. Now, you all mentioned that the optimal capacity is somewhere between a 75 and a 115%. Um, I, I, I'm, is that uh, referenced by the comprehensive infrastructure assessment that was done a few years back by operations? So we did use that when we were compiling data from multiple sources. We used that infrastructure assessment. Um, that's where that um, optimal capacity formula was initially used, was for that infrastructure assessment in 16, 17. Mm -hmm. And so we do, we're using that formula, but then we also looked at the KDE, KDE building audit. We look at our floor plans. We talk with the principals about um, how they're using the space to kind of compile everything into one formula and then use a baseline that's, we can compare all schools apples to apples. Okay, um, because my understanding was with that infrastructure assessment that there was a, uh, a percentage of capacity that was a part of, when you take a look at every school, there was one of the data points that was there. And my understanding was that 100% meant 100%. 110% uh, meant it's really crowded. It's not that, oh, we're still within our guidelines. It's just really crowded. I, I've taken issue in the past, and I still do, with the way that we consider uh, what usable space is. And we've had numerous discussions about this. I'll reiterate those points here in the fact that we consider some uh, teachable space to be stages in cafeterias or gymnasiums. Uh, that's incredibly... Uh, hard to teach in, and I've known, I know that from experience because I've been a substitute teacher before and I've had to teach in those environments, where you have an entire room that's trying to learn how to do art or math or what have you. When you're separated by the cafeteria where the entire school is having lunch by nothing but a curtain, uh, it's unfair to those kids in the cafeteria because they don't have a chance to be able to talk to their friends and give them a relief from having to be quiet and you know, and reserved and not have a chance to be able to, you know, enjoy the short time that they have to be able to eat. It's unfair to the kids that are on the stage in this classroom, and I use that in air quotes because it's not really a classroom, and the fact that they're being distracted because there's 100 kids going in and out of a door and going through a, a line to get food. There's certain noise that's unavailable or is unavoidable with that. Um, we use, you know, gymnasiums as classrooms, which they're really not designed to be. Um, you know, the, you mentioned the Kentucky standards. Kentucky standards really don't look at that. Kentucky, if you were to take a look at a school, you know, Kentucky looks at a, we'll say it's, uh, we'll say a thousand kids could be there, but we somehow managed to turn that thousand per, uh, kid capacity into 1,100 kids. We have a number of teachers that are on carts. We have got to get rid of that practice, and we've talked about that, but I'd like to know from either a superintendent or you all or whatnot, what are we going to do about getting to a point where our teachers actually have a home room and they can plan and they can stay in their home room during their planning period and get to the point where they can plan not just for today's classes but for the week or what have you. We had talked about trying to move to that at some point, but that's been over you know, a few years ago. What are we going to do to move to that point and when? Well, I think this gets into student assignment question. I mean, we can clearly look at the projected enrollments and see that um, we are over capacity in certain areas and under capacity in others, and that's the infrastructure we have right now. So, I mean, our options are to put a hard cap on school enrollment um, and say that is it. No one else gets in this school above um, a certain capacity. Um, I don't think that's what we want to do, um, you know, as and 
what we would have to do in order to do that, especially when we have growing resides areas in many of the schools that you're, you're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I think that's going to, I wish there was a quick answer to that. I think that's going to have to be a part of our facilities plan. I think you're referencing a lot of middle schools in your area, which clearly our middle schools are an issue when it becomes to enrollment projection. Um, just because of what we've done in the past decade, um, removing a school, a middle school. Um, I think that had a, a pretty big impact. Um, but also the amount of homes, as you saw, that are going up in that area. So I think building a middle school that you all have decided to do will alleviate that. I know that's not an overnight um, decision, but clearly that's gonna make a difference. I think student assignment that we look at and we say, okay, we're gonna take a look at some schools that may be way under capacity and look at making them magnets that would draw kids in. Um, but I think these are gonna be long-term steps. I don't think that there's gonna be, which I think we're doing, but I just don't think it's gonna be something that we can say, we're gonna put, just put a hard cap on a school. Um, I think we're gonna to have to make some tough decisions around facilities and student assignment. I wanna mention this because it's gonna circle back around, we have a discussion about budgets a little bit later. And I want us to be thinking about this because this is this evergreen conversation that we keep having over and over and over again, and we've got to move po past a point of discussion. I think uh, we are, though. I mean, well, I we, we are. are. And, I think and, we're, we've I, approved a new middle school. That's right. And we and, are doing the student assignment work. So, And I you know that I have not complained about that at all. Um, but it's not just middle schools. Uh, you know, we have high schools that are suddenly over capacity. Uh, you know, I have two high schools, one of which has gone down and, you know, has available capacity, uh, one of which is well over it now, uh, where it used to be the other way around a few years ago. So I know our demographics are shifting, but our high schools, our middle schools, and a lot of our elementary schools um, that I and other board members represent, they are busting at the seams and have been for a while. So I know that building facilities is one thing, but we have, you know, we just had a discussion about student assignment. Having caps on that really wasn't part of that discussion, but, you know, maybe it should be. And I certainly agree. I would not want to get to a point where that is, where we were doing that. But when I look at these projections and I look at teachers that are on carts and being in that position as a long-term sub at one point, I can tell you how ineffective that is or how incredibly challenging that is to be able to plan and to be able to, you know, get from one class to the other, especially in a very, very uh, busy high school, uh, is daunting at best, and it does eat into instruction time. And I think that these are things that are affecting student, uh, student achievement that we need. We've been having, you know, when I was subbed, it was over 11 years ago. And these are still issues that we're grappling with, and I am starting to lose patience <laughs> about trying to address them. I'll also say that if you all do approve a dual resides, that will have a major impact on enrollment across the district. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, there's a lot of moving pieces and parts to it. I, I do think we are doing the action that we need to in order to address it. Um, but clearly, I know it's a difficult part right now. Well, I also want to have, you know, because I've asked questions specifically, how many classes or how many schools are having rooms that aren't, you know, ideally being used the way they should be? Uh, how many teachers on carts? I didn't really get answers to that, specific answers, I got generalized question, answers. But these are things that I think we really need to start looking at and we've got to get ahead of. Well, we have been out asking our principals collecting that data. I mean, that we don't have a database on that, but we're working to collect all of that data so we can present that to you. All right. Board Member Craig. Just a brief comment, and not about the uh, projected enrollments, but the allocations. Um, I know we're working on student assignment and I know we're building this East End Middle School and I'm happy about all of that work. But to me, the solution is the work that's coming out of the Revenue Committee. Um, I don't have specific comments about your allocations um, or enrollments, but I hope that this time next year, uh, we're dealing with substantially more revenue in the district and that we're able to talk about much more, uh, the allocation of more teachers to these uh, troubled schools and the construction of not only the five new schools we're building already, in addition to Senate, uh, Shawnee, the West End Middle School, but uh, perhaps more schools throughout the county. Um, so just pitching the answer to all these problems is revenue. Um, we'll talk about that more, I'm sure, at the board retreat. But Agreed. Thanks.
Thank you. Any other questions? Um, could you explain to us how you determine uh, projected student enrollment when we talk about that we're having new developments built? Do we assume that every house built will have a child that will come to JCPS? Or what is the formula that you use? No, so on the pre-applications, I mean, we know based on history, some of those are filed and they never break ground at all, or they may file a pre-application for 500 lots and it ends up being half that. So typically, we we will look at the active building permits as the students move in. Um, and we also have to factor in the price point of the houses. You know, that may affect the number of students that we would have in JCPS, whether they're uh, families that are moving in or, you know, younger people that don't have kids yet or older folks. So we do take that into consideration in our model. And so we have a number of, we develop a number of coefficients, look at the past historical data, trying to predict the future trends. Okay. Um, one other question that I have, uh, as we talk about um, our uh, enrollment in our schools, and I heard you say that the fifth day count, the 20 day count, and those kinds of things. So what happens as uh, the school year rolls along and we have more students that are enrolling in schools <clears throat> than what we have um, provided financial resources for as the year goes forward? in some of the schools uh, in District 1 and during the course of the year, students are transferred into a building and it increases their enrollment. So what is the process for, for increasing the resources as the enrollment increases? If there is um, a large increase, um, a principal will request to set up a new classroom. If that happens, that budget request comes forward, I typically present it to the superintendent, and then they are funded accordingly in order to set up that classroom. And one other question I have about small class sizes, which is what we have a lot of in our elementary schools, and we have found that to be successful uh, for student learning in the elementary schools. As we move forward with getting information from um, the uh, diagnosis, of, I guess, of the schools that have been looked at and the recommendations that will come to us. How do we handle if we are, if it is uh, recommended or requested that we take some of these class sizes down? Uh, we were at Leadership Louisville today and maybe the principals know the numbers, but the, uh, some of the people in the, in the building don't know the number because I talked with the group and they said that their, their number in high school was 35. For high school, I have not seen a 35 number up there at all. So I think that we need to communicate more within our system so people understand what, what the numbers are. But, but how do we manage? One of the uh, processes through the training is that we go over the allocation formula with the principals. And again, the training for new principals is mandatory, but we often have many seasoned uh, principals that attend along with the individual that they have working on their budgets. So as far as every A1 school, we apply first the standard allocation formula that you all prove and that we're presenting this evening. After that, we then look at add-ons. So if there is a small class size for a particular school and it's continuing because the board has approved small class size for that school, then we add the appropriate uh, teaching staff in order to accomplish that based on the enrollment. Okay, thank you. I'll have more questions as we go on, but I, I'm very concerned about when we go through the review and what we are being asked to do, how we will in fact fund that for uh, the number of schools that we have that have been identified that need um, and it's not the money piece that I'm talking about. I'm talking about what are we need, what do we need to do for the students that are there in order to um, increase reading and math. That's specifically what my concerns are, whether it's uh, 20, 24 in the classroom and how do we fund that. And a uh, good question from Board Member Marshall as you train, change leadership, how does everybody understand the process and I've heard you say that we train our principals and the people under them. So somehow we need to get the message out to the teachers because they're carrying a message also. Not because, not in a bad way, but um, again, uh, if teachers think that we, we are putting 35 students in high school classes, 
that's a, I think that's a concern that we, we need to, to hear that. Um, th that completes my questions. Any other questions? Okay. So we will start with the uh, first item, which is the recommendation for approval of student enrollment projections for 2020-2021. Is there a motion to approve the student enrollment projections for 2020-2021? Is there a motion, Board Member Duncan, second by Board Member Marshall? All those in favor? It passes unanimously. Thank you. The next motion, is there a motion to approve the school allocation standards for 20 20, 2021, um, is there a motion? Board Member Marshall, second by Board Member Duncan. All those in favor, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much for your presentation. Ready? Mm -hmm. Our final uh, information item of the evening will be um, the draft budget, um, which as you know is kind of the outline, the beginning point that we uh, work on. Once again, I'll turn it over to Cordelia to present. Um, and we'll take questions on that. The draft budget, as uh, you all know, is the first of the three budgets that we will be presenting to the board for the 2021 uh, fiscal year. The tentative will come forward in May 12th and then May 26th for requesting actual approval of that. At, listed here are the three budgets that we're dealing with. I, I need to emphasize that the draft budget is basically a starting point uh, of discussion for this new year budget. It represents our initial uh, position prior to adding any of the major initiatives that represent the strategies to get us to the next level. The tentative will include a majority of the decisions related to the new year budget priorities that you, the, the board, has approved. And then the working budget is the final budget, uh, which will include updated tax assessments, uh, school flex carryover, carry forwards, which are the encumbrances and which are outstanding purchase orders, obligations that we have made but have just not been paid as of uh, June 30th of the previous year. Within this budget, we have made uh, several revenue assumptions. We have assumed that the board will levy a property tax rate that will generate a 4% gain in revenue. If you do that, based on the assessments that we know of today, that would be an additional $20.3 million. In addition, we have motor vehicle value increase. We have assumed approximately a 4.5% value increase in motor vehicles. So that would generate 1.4 million increase in revenue. Occupational taxes, we've assumed 4% increase there also, which is a $7 million increase. Now, a big portion of our um, revenue, of course, majority is for property taxes, but we also have a piece that is, as you know, the state seek. One of the big issues with this uh, seek formula is as property values increase, then the state seek will decrease. So because of the assumption of the assessment values uh, increasing, we have assumed that there is going to be a projected decrease of $10.7 million in seek. We've also assumed at this point that seek will uh, be flat. Now we'll know more once the state gets into their budget but at this point in time, this is all we know. So we've got to deal with that 4,000 uh, that we currently receive uh, for uh, per pupil base. This is uh, just to show you a trend of how uh, revenues are definitely based more support on revenue from property taxes, local revenues, where the state seat continues to decrease. So our, at this point, our survival, our uh, new programs are going to be reliant mostly on our property tax ability. Expenses included in the general fund budget. Uh, you can see that listed there. There is no cost of living yet included in the budget. 
Uh, that will be determined later through the budget cycle as we begin our negotiations with the unions. Um, other than the stipend for certified staff at our accelerated improvement schools, other negotiated compensation is not embedded in our salary projections. Um, other than that, you can see some of the um, items that we have included. I will tell you that a cost of living increase, a 1% increase, will cost the general fund approximately $7 million. This is just a high overview of the status of, again, the draft budget. It is very preliminary. There could be additional revenues coming in. There could be uh, expenses that are that may come out or expenses that could be added. Uh, you will see that we have taken vacancy credit and other salary adjustments there in the tune of $30 million. We have looked um, at past historical trends, and when we budget, we bu budget on actual salaries of the positions that are there at the time that we do the budget. So um, in the working budget, we're using the actuals. Based on that historical data, we have seen that when we budget for uh, those, we do have vacancies that occur. The timing in filling positions as well as uh, individuals that may go on unpaid leave. And all that impacts. This is not just teachers. This is bus drivers, custodians, clerical support. It's vacancies throughout uh, the district. Our next step on our budget decisions, um, this, if the board, um, having approved the allocation standards, the draft budget is strictly a review for uh, you all. You do not have to approve the draft budget. Uh, we will, tomorrow, um, release the budgets to the departments and to the schools based on the standard allocation formula and the projections that, were, that you approved uh, earlier. Then on uh, February 24th, schools and central office will submit back to us their budget items and we enter, have them enter that into the system. We intend to bring forward to you on March 24th a possible list of quantified items that we assume that we're going to be able to put into the tentative budget. May 12th is the work session on the tentative and we hope to have the impact of the state budget by then because normally that session ends in April. And we will be asking on May 26 for your approval of the tentative budget. And then in September, of course, that's when we're dealing with the working. And that concludes our questions. Ms. Duncan first. Who wants to go after Ms. Duncan? Who's next after Ms. Duncan? Board Member Marshall and then Board Member Craig. Ms. Duncan. Oh, Cordelia, last year's receipts from taxes compared to the year before's receipts, I mean this year, the, the ones that we got in for this year mm -hmm. compared to the ones we got last year, mm -hmm. uh, do you happen to know what that difference is overall? I mean, to subtract one from the other and, and what the difference is there? Uh, are we talking about this, cur this current year we're in? Com yes. Where we just collected? Yes. Um, right now, and that's part of that, um, the financial report, the monthly financial report that is on the agenda, you will see that the graph of the revenues is a little lower as compared to expenses. And one of the things, because we are so reliant on local revenue, and most of our revenue comes in from property taxes starting in, Janu in November, November, December, and January. And then we get the SEEK, it's a monthly payment. In this particular year, November was much lower than the previous year because of the way Thanksgiving holiday fell. Because of those last two days being November 28th and 29th, the two bi last business days of the month, those tax revenues did not come in until December. So when you get the December monthly report, you will see they are more in line and our fund balance is much higher because of the collections. Okay, that's what I was wondering about. And that 5%, when you said that there was a 5% increase in what? What was that 5% increase 
was that in the assessments that that we uh, did receive uh, at that point or could that be bigger uh, by December um, I'd have to go back and look miss Duncan I, I am drawing a blank on that all right there well there was a five percent increase and I, I just wrote the percentage down and uh, and I wanted to just kind of clarify what that five percent increase was if you if we if you were talking about in total revenue from last year to what we have this year so far or yeah, I don't, I don't know what total that was. Revenue, uh, the increase for total <laughs> revenue, I know it's not 5%, but uh, let me look that up and I'll get back with All you. All right, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Board Member Marshall and then Board Member Craig. All right. Uh, thank you all once again. Um, this is always good conversation <laughs> when we talk about uh, spending. Um, so can we talk a little bit more about uh, the 11.9 million in the steps and the general fund? Mm -hmm. Is that coming from the teachers we currently have and then moving through the current steps? It's not just teachers. Okay. It's um, every employee, if they work at least 140 days in, the pre in that previous year, then come July 1, the next year, they get a step on the salary schedule that is teachers as well as uh, classified staff. Okay, and I'm correct that I heard you say a 1% uh, increase on the cost of living is seven million? That's correct. Okay, and we haven't included that in the draft budget? That's correct, we have not. Okay, well I'd like us to be bold uh, and brave um, to make sure that we do what needs to be done uh, coming from this board member. Um, because I think if we're going to talk about a lot of things we've talked about, we know, uh, echoing board member Craig, uh, it's gonna take revenue. Um, and so I'd rather look at this as, okay, what are all the things that it's gonna take? And we can bring it to you and you just say, okay, this is what it's gonna cost. Yes. Uh, and then we work together to figure out how to make that happen uh, in the best interest of our students and those that do the work every day. So uh, that's all I have, thank you so much. Board Member Craig. Uh, echoing Board Member Marshall, echoing Board Member Craig, we need more revenue uh, to meet all these goals. Thank you, sir. Um, I know the budget reflects all the priorities that we spent a lot of time debating in the uh, fall. Uh, it's worth emphasizing from one board member uh, the need for um, uh, teacher salary increases and salary increases for all of our bargain units. We're all concerned about the cost of living adjustments. Um, and how that reflects the raises that they've received over the last couple of years. So as we're preparing these numbers, mm -hmm. keeping those in mind as we begin negotiations, I guess in May or June of this year, um, just wanted to repeat it one more time. And we're hoping that uh, there is support out of Frankfurt, um, good conversations around additional uh, pay for teachers out of Frankfurt as well. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that too. Other questions, Mr. Brady? Thank you, Chair. Um, if we can go back to slide three in the presentation, I just want to reiterate this. So if I'm looking at this correctly, if we increase property taxes by the regular 4% that we were able to do so, mm -hmm. uh, it's $20.3 million increase to our budget. However, you're also telling me, uh, telling us, okay, the motor vehicle value increase is going to be uh, 1.4, so that's going to be uh, 21 you know, and a half, we'll just, you know, round down a little bit just to be opt uh, a little optimistic or pessimistic. And then occupational, ta um, occupational taxes that will then uh, increase that by another $7 million. So, but, but then we have this $10 million hit. So that kind of erases a lot of what we're seeing here. So what we're talking about is if we do the full 4%, we're going to have less than $20 million. Uh, if I'm looking at that correct? Overall, so we're looking 18. at a net increase of about $18 million. Yeah. All right, so now if I'm moving back down on the presentation and I go to slide six, then I see you're projecting a total hit to the budget for this year of $20 million. And I'm, I assume you're including that $18 million in an additional revenue. Despite that, we're still you know, $19 million 
and that will come out of, I would presume, fund balance. Fund balance, again, but I need to um, mention again, this is very preliminary. Oh, of course, but yeah. we need to, I want to make sure we are looking at what we need to look at. Sure. Uh, Ms. Gilpin, can you bring up the chart that I asked you to pull up? Um, this is the chart that you pulled together of data mm -hmm. that I had asked for earlier. This is our current fund balance over the last few years. Um, the fund balance on the far right here that you're seeing is currently at 91.6 million, correct? correct. Um, at one point, we were as high as uh, uh, 153.6 million. Um, <clears throat> generally, for, for I think most good budgeting, uh, for most good operating uh, budgets, would take into account that you would at least need a 10%, maybe 15% of uh, your total budget as your fund balance, just in case? Uh, you typically would want to have two, in my opinion, and in the opinion of the uh, Government Finance Officers Association, you would have a two-month operating uh, balance. Uh, and, what, and what would that be currently for our budget well, of $1.7 uh, Um A 2% is around... I know it's 2%, but two-month yeah. operating. Uh, Two-month operating would be around um, $80 million, okay. 80, 80 to 85. All right. Most, gov most businesses that I'm aware of say that you really need between 10 and 15%. True. Yes. Um, so at this point, if we were just to have 10%, we would actually need a little under uh, twice what we have here. Uh, with a $1.7, $1.8 billion budget, mm -hmm. we would need to have, you know, $180 million. Uh, That would be... 10%. Well, We're, you know, about half that right now. So my concern is that we have been eating away at fund balance over the course of the last few years, and you have talked about this during the last few years. I'm aware of that. Uh, but I think that I want to make sure all my colleagues and the public is aware of this as well, and the fact that we're getting, we're, I, I think, dangerously close to not having an adequate rainy day fund. Um, you know, over the last few years, uh, we've been criticized for having a, uh, a rainy day fund. At one point, we were criticized for having the $153 million uh, rainy day fund by the governor at the time during the Commonwealth to uh, the address of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. I don't think that's going to happen tonight, thankfully. But I do want to point this out in the fact that we really probably need to get to a point where we have at least 10%. At least that's what I would feel minimally comfortable with. Well, let me uh, also mention this is the general fund. The $1.8 is our total budget. Mm -hmm. um, the $1.8, each of the other funds also have a um, fund balance, such as a construction fund. There's money set aside there. So and included in the general fund is also the state paid on behalf benefits. That's almost $300 million. So even with this 91 million, we are close to a 10% of the actual expenditures of a uh, general fund budget. So we're okay. Um, again, you're absolutely correct. We need to be careful not to go uh, lower because we also have to look at cash flow because of when the property taxes come in um, and to be able to handle those obligations in the summer. All right, so, but my concern remains on this, that I think we need to make sure we keep an eye on that. And that does lead into the argument regarding an increase in revenue, but I also think it leads into the argument that I have been advocating for for a number of years now of making sure we do adequate program review. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a lot of things that are going to be hitting our budget here in the next couple of years. We just talked about if we approve a student assignment plan that's being proposed, then that's going to be the increase of an additional middle school. On top of that, we're also going to have to build or allocate or repurpose another facility that will be a middle school slash high school for the Girls of Colors Academy to be able to make sure we have parity from a Title IX perspective for the WWEB Du Bois Academy. So we are going to have some things that we need to take keep our eye on, and when we take a look at these budget projections, yes, that's for this year, but we, because everything compounds over, you know, year over year, I think it's, it would behoove us to be able to put some of these long-term goals up here on this presentation just so we can get an eye on what we're planning for. Uh, and I don't want to get caught by surprise by something that we discussed one year and then suddenly the, the price tag pops up and, you know, a lot of things have happened in between, and we lose sight of that. Um, 
I just you know, want to you know, purposefully point this out to, one, build the case for new revenue, but also ask that we also, you know, from a taxpayer perspective, and I, don't, I know all of us have heard this concern, that, you know, what do you do with all that money? You have this really big, huge budget now. Right. We have a, a budget that's in line of school districts of our size, and there's not another school district of our size within the state, so it's really hard to make that comparison. Right. And so no one looks at that. But we also need to make sure that we turn to the uh, taxpayer and say, yes, we are doing program review. We are making sure that we're discontinuing programs that aren't working and keeping those and expanding those that do. Uh, but I also want to make sure that we have an adequate fund balance and rainy day fund because you never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. Other comments? This is a question that I don't know if this is the right night to answer the question or not, but I am, uh, I've tried to get it answered last time and I don't think I worded it correctly, so I'll try again. As we talk about uh, dollars to programs and to um, uh, particular, for example, if we took um, s school ABC and we're given that school X amount of money, how does the board determine how much of that money is actually going to students versus the other administrative costs, costs that happen in that building. We have invested as a board uh, uh, collectively and agreeably for several programs like uh, restorative practice and deeper learning and some of these other programs. So how do we, how does the board understand, you tell us what the amount that we have budgeted, how much of that money is actually going to the local school I know some is always at central office because you have uh, folks that work at that level, but how much is impacting the students in the local school? And if this is not the right night to ask that question, I'm good with that. Just tell me the night that I need to ask it because I'm, I'm, the reason I keep asking these questions about local school because um, we don't know what they're gonna recommend to us to do for the schools that we are working to improve on. And I am curious to understand um, how the money is getting to the local school. I do understand that our lowest, um, our schools that are low performing schools have the highest amount of money per pupil, but clearly that is not making the academic difference that we need. So um, maybe you can help me. And again, if this is the wrong night and the wrong session, then uh, just raise my hand when we get to the right session because I think as a public and as the board, I would like to know how our money is impacting student learning school by school, particularly the schools that have been identified in the accountability analysis about how they are, what needs to be done in those schools. And we have invested wisely. I don't think anyone has ever complained anywhere along the line, but my concern is academic performance for our students. I would say the first piece is within the budget um, actual document, you'll see how much is allocated to each school and what their historical um, expenses have been for the two or three previous years, as well as the budget this current year and what we're projecting the budget, the draft budget for um, next year. But within that, there's a lot of pieces and we would need to break down, depend upon what you're wanting to see, we can break down, this is teacher salaries, this is um, classified support, this is administrative salaries. We can give that detail by school. In addition, where it really comes into play, I would say for the programs, uh, specific programs, is on our add-on programs, or it could be in a central office budget that is then allocated services provided to the schools. So it would take some uh, additional details provided to you because right now the information that you've got does not have all of those details. Now it is on the website by school. Um, if you were to look at uh, the website that John and his staff have put together, you could go to a particular school and you can see what their normal allocations are, which is one of those screens I showed you, where it has the allocations of staffing as well as what that staffing cost. In addition, there is a uh, section that tells you about the add-ons for a particular school. Mm -hmm. And so it, we have that for every school in the district. But we can try to put together um, 
some kind of summary to maybe help you understand what we're allocating, um, I, I can give it a shot. So um, my question for, for Dr. Polio is how do we deal with what we are going to be asked to do when the state comes in and they have looked at our schools and they have recommendations to us? How do we put dollars to services for kids? Can you help me with that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to have to look at what the priorities are for each school um, and then make those decisions. Obviously, that will go through the AIS office where we will um, increase supports, especially to those new schools that have joined on. Um, but we would be happy once we get those to review those and, and make a recommendation to you of, of the money that would need to be attached to that. Okay, so as a school board member, when that AIS um, meeting comes together, I guess, are those open meetings or is it you might, they might present a number of things and only get, say I might present five and I only get three. How do we determine how the schools get what, what they ask for? And I know everybody asks for everything. I'm not, you know, I'm Yeah, I well, forgotten. I mean, the, the AIS office meets with each school to determine what they need. So we've made some adjustments to schools based upon um, when the data came out. So we added staff members. We met with staff. There were four or five schools that we met with to find additional resources, um, a couple schools, behavior coaches, additional instructional coach. Um, so we did that as the scores came out, that we added those staff members to schools. Um, and um, we'll continue to do that based upon once we get the um, assessments back from the state. Um, but usually that's in collaboration with the principal and the assistant superintendent to decide what's needed um, to support the school. Okay, and as a school board member that has um, schools that are in that category, do I request that information from you? So when people stop me in my community mm -hmm. and ask me what we are doing, I have a better answer for them, except we're working on it. Sure. Okay, thank yep. you. I, I will definitely do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cordelia. Again, if it was the wrong night, you did a great job, so <laughs> it'll come back in another form. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Shul. Let's have one quick question. Is there being, is there any room, any margin for, um, the creation of positions that are needed, especially positions um, that will help us improve as it relates to equity. Well, yes, I think there are as we move into the new year. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the challenge we have and continue to have is we add staff, we have to either look for new revenue or, or mm -hmm eliminate other staffs or we take it from the fund balance as Mr. Brady was talking about. So um, we do that at times, um, but um, we are definitely reviewing with each department um, ways in which we can support their work. And so um, that could definitely be a part of the new budget. Yeah, I think it's critical to ensure that there is equity across departments as it relates uh, to the supports that um, various uh, administrative personnel receives. And so um, I would definitely like to see that. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. One more, Ms. Duncan, and then we're gonna call for the uh, acceptance of this. Go ahead. Yes, I just meant to ask about this 377,000 that's, uh, that's uh, by the AIS uh, school, mm -hmm. what our schools, what? Uh, I mean, I know it's not, that's not incentives because that's a whole lot bigger number than that. So the 377, I was just. That, that is, um, it's specific schools, specific items we've provided. Iroquois High School, a security monitor was 43,000. A half of resource teacher for Indian Trail, Camp Taylor and Slaughter, that was 116, almost 117,000. Um, Maupin received 131,000 and King uh, received 86,000. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so if I understand correctly, this is uh, the beginning of the beginning. This is not the final product, but for tonight, we're being asked to uh, receive the general fund draft budget for 2020, 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, is there a motion? Board Member Duncan, uh, seconded by Board Member Craig. All those in favor? 
the motion passes unanimously. Thank you so much for all the excla extra explanations that we're asking for. Appreciate it very much. We're going to move on now to the uh, consent calendar. Several items have been pulled down this evening. So I would like to say that uh, the following items have been pulled down by Mr. Brady. Item XP30, which is a recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with the Jefferson County Teachers Association and XR, which is the recommendation for approval of contracts for non-resident pupils for fiscal year 2021. Pulled down by board member Craig, these two items are being pulled down because he wants to abstain from the vote. So I will just say that so that you know that we don't have to go in, into an explanation for that. The items that have been pulled down by Mr. Craig to, for, his, uh, for him to abstain are XP25, recommendation for approval of agreement with agreement with Centerstone of Kentucky for on-site behavior mental health services and XP26 recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with the Spiritus Inc. for on-site behavioral and mental health services. So having said that, at this point, is there a motion to receive the consent calendar minus the items that I just mentioned? And if you've forgotten, it's XP30, XR, XP25, and XP26. Is there a motion to receive? Board Member Marshall, seconded by uh, Board Member Shul. All those in favor, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. I want to go on to Board Member Craig's first because it's just a matter of uh, uh, abstaining for those. So XP25, recommendation for the approval of the memorandum from Centerstone. And the next one is recommendation for approval of the agreement with Uspiritus. So is there a motion to... Um, to accept those with the understanding that he's going to abstain for both, or do you want me to do them separately? What's your pleasure? You can do both. Okay. Is I there do, a motion? I, I do. Just I need to have the record reflect that my partner now, my partner works for Centerstone, so I'm going to from this point going forward abstain on all Centerstone issues. I haven't in the past, but her job position has changed such that uh, it would be prudent to do so. So thank you. Okay. So. Is there a motion to uh, approve XP25 uh, memorandum of agreement with Centerstone of Kentucky and XP26 recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with Uspiritus? Is there a motion? Board Member Brady, seconded by Board Member Duncan. All those in favor? Board, all in favor except Board Member Craig. All those abstaining? Board Member Craig, thank you. Moving on. Uh, XP30, pulled down by Board Member Grady, Brady. Approval of the Memorandum of Agreement with the Jefferson County Teachers Association. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would like to make a motion on this particular item that we, uh, if we can remove item three on this, uh, on this list, this is regarding JCPS will place the following affidavit acknowledgement and agreement on the login screen for absence management. And it states by logging in, uh, logging into absence uh, management to request a substitute. I acknowledge that I am creating an official record. I further acknowledge that the leave requested will be utilized solely for the express reason stated as permitted by Board Policy 03.1232 or 03232. Um, my request to be able to pull this out is uh, I would like to be able to vote on that particular issue uh, separately. Uh, and part of the reason for this is because. I feel that I understand that state law talks about the fact that you need to uh, state what type of uh, leave you're uh, trying to take, whether it's sick leave or a personal day or whatnot, but I've always found that to be quite limiting and uh, really unnecessary, and I don't think we treat, uh, by doing that, whether it's state workers or teachers, uh, that we're treating our, uh, our employees as the adults that they actually are. Uh, in the business world, we have flex days, at least for most companies. And if you have a flex day, you can take it for whatever reason you want, whether that's a mental health day, a vacation day, a sick day. You have a set number. You take those flex days, and you can do it whatever you would like. Uh, because of the fact that that type of freedom isn't afforded to teachers and state workers, this was part of the basis for some of the things that went on during the previous administration, trying to punish teachers for demonstrating in Frankfurt. Um, but I understand that there is an affidavit and acknowledgement that happens at the end of this uh, request process whenever a uh, teacher or uh, employee requests time away. Mm -hmm. I know that this is taking that particular acknowledgement and moving up to the front 
So I, I understand that, but I just think fundamentally this really needs to change from our employees. Uh, they should just have flex time and be able to take it however they want. Um, our, our, they currently do have uh, what are called personal days. So they mm -hmm. have three personal days um, as a part of the negotiations. Now when we negotiate a contract, we can, you know, uh, perfectly Actually we can't because state law says we can't. Can't. We, I have actually proposed actually saying okay. all days, all leave, any, whether it's sick, personal, whatever, it's a flex, right. you know, to try and do that as a flex day. Previous legal counsel has told, uh, has informed us that we're not able to do that under the state statute. That's not really a board policy, even though this particular issue does state board policy. I understand the limitations and I understand what I'm asking here is not necessarily something that can necessarily be helped. But I do believe, I'm hoping that maybe this might start some conversation at the state level to be able to treat our state employees as okay. regular adults. This isn't something I'm criticizing JCPS for. I just have an issue of uh, the fact that we have to, folks have to say, I have a health issue and I have to take a day off. I think that's an intensely private thing and you shouldn't have to do that. If you have X amount of days to take off, you should be able to take them however you wish. I think if, uh, uh, from my perspective, if a teacher said I have a health issue and need to take a day off, they could use that. We just, in collaboration with JCTA and working on this, um, both agreed that this was just a way for saying I'm using this as a, as, um, an, a health issue, as a sick day, and not for other reasons. My, my thing is I think you, should, you shouldn't have to state that. All right. I'm a little bit uncomfortable, uh, Tyson, so if you would speak to this because we're talking about an agreement with JCPS and JCTA, and I, I understand what Mr. Brady is asking for, but we're not able at this point to get both parties together to have the conversation, so would you give me some guidance, please? Right. Uh, yeah, I, your options as a board at this point, um, that the, the, my understanding is that this agreement, has been, this agreement as is has been approved by uh, JCTA. Uh, and so if we go back with something else, it will open up, um, you know, negotiations again. Uh, it would be, uh, uh, they would be their option whether to agree to what we send back to them or not if we do something other than agree to what the, the joint proposal is. So certainly the board is welcome to do that, just as the same as they're welcome to accept or reject the entirety of this. Uh, if you want to break it into pieces, you can break it into pieces. But if you do that, the corresponding effect will be that it really will serve as a counter proposal mm -hmm. back to JCTA, which they then can determine whether they want to agree to or not. Uh, the negotiated proposal between the district negotiators and JCTA negotiators is for the entirety of this agreement. And so if we break it into pieces, essentially you would be making a counter proposal, a new counter proposal to JCTA for their consideration. Is this agreement time sensitive? Is it something that we could bring back at the next meeting? Or, or I'm that would asking be a for question a better answered by Dr. Polio, I think. Okay. I mean, I think since we're in the General Assembly right now, it is time sensitive. Um, I think there are a few parts of this that might not be, but I think there are some things that are time sensitive in it. So what we're doing, we're going to make a motion to receive uh, the recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with the Jefferson County Teachers Association, XP, and the question is if we vote for XP 30, then we are approving the memorandum. If we don't vote for it, then uh, Board Member Brady is recommending some changes to it, which we actually, cannot make tonight. Actually, point of question, uh, I've made a motion to remove this particular section with the, the motion on the floor needs to be voted on and whether that motion passes or not then that will determine whether or not this entire thing gets, gets that's correct yes yeah, to, so. to break this apart and then enter basically the next phase your motion would need to to pass yeah, that, is but that motion needs to be addressed first before looking at the entire item as a whole correct but it first needs a second right yes and your motion needs a second, am I Which correct, or do we don't do seconds for this? No, it would need a second to. Okay, to, so to the motion on the floor, the reason we had the conversation was trying to understand the purpose of why you had pulled it down. So your motion is to not move forward with this. Uh, My motion is to remove item three from the whole of, of this particular uh, item, so. Remove section or uh, number three from um, 
agenda item XP.30. And there, just, just to clarify, uh, Mr. Brady, you want to remove it entirely or you want to separate it and vote I on it? I want to separate, separate it uh, okay. separate out, uh, separate it out for a separate vote. Okay. Is there a second? Motion dies there for lack go. of a second. Okay, moving on. XR, recommendation for approval of contracts for non-resident pupils for fiscal year 2020. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, sorry. We still need to actually vote for right. XP. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the, the issue remains for consideration. There, there was an, an attempt to alter the nature in which it would be considered. That failed, and so now we just need to consider it as is. So now Correct. we need to go yeah. back. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's help on this first meeting of the year. The motion is recommendation for, I'm asking for a motion for the recommendation for approval of the memorandum of agreement with the Jefferson County Teachers Association. Is there a motion, board member Duncan, second by board member Craig. All those in favor of this, please indicate. So it's unanimous. Okay, thank you very much. Next, we will move on to XR, recommendation for approval of contracts for non-resident pupils for fiscal year 2020-2021. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chair. This uh, particular issue is, I have the same issue with this uh, item as I did the last time this was under board consideration, at which time previous general counsel said that they would take a look at this contract and make changes to the uh, formatting of this contract. Uh, as uh, since there is no cap to the number of students that might have inter-district transfers, I'd ask for there to be some type of cap to that, as well as changes to the formatting of this because it's an in, the way other districts have filled out this form is very inconsistent and, and it's confusing. And there's no set guidelines for how this form should appear. One district uses a di different format as opposed to our district. Um, Council at the time said that they would take that into consideration and come back with changes. No change has been made, so therefore my objection still remains, and I'll be voting against this. So, so your recommendation is? Well, my recommendation doesn't matter right now because it hasn't changed at all. At the time, what, what last time that this was considered was back in May 28th of last year. Uh, at the time, legal counsel had said that they'll take make changes of that. That those changes have not occurred. My objections remain, uh, you know, not a full year later, but almost a full year later. And uh, since the f uh, form hasn't changed and no change has been made that I can see whatsoever. Is there a motion to for the recommendation for the approval of contracts for non-resident pupils for fiscal year 2020-2021? Board Member Marshall, seconded by Board Member Craig. All those in favor of that motion? All board members, um, all those opposed, board member Brady, all were in favor of it and it was opposed by board member Brady. Thank you very much. So I think we have taken care of the consent calendar or have we done that since I think we did that first, unless I've forgotten something. We did that first, okay. So now we're going to move on uh, because we have uh, Ty bids. Dr. Chris. Uh, items number 157 and 475 on bid ID 7784 for instructional office supplies line item. And the items are awarded to uh, Pyramid School Products, Inc. Pyramid School Products, Inc. Bit? Mm -hmm. that yeah, that's okay. Good. Thank you. Next item, uh, the board planning calendar. Is there a motion to receive the planning calendar? Board member Marshall, seconded by board member Craig. All those in favor? So quick Mo comment before we vote. I'm sorry, I wanted to inject. Um, w there was some discussion last year about um, the meetings for agenda planning for board members to participate. And I think that's um, relevant to this discussion about the planning calendar for the rest of the year. Um, we had talked about adding a third board member, perhaps occasionally, to those board uh, agenda planning meetings. And if we could have that discussion again this year, 
I wanted to throw that out there. I don't know if this is the place to talk about that or not. But So I would say that's not something that the board has to vote on. Board members right. are always invited to come to the planning, agenda planning meetings as long as we don't get more than three people in the room at one time. Initially when I came to this board, we had the p agenda planning meeting with the superintendent was with the board chair only. Then we moved to the board chair and the vice chair. Typically when we bring new members to the board, you are invited to come to the agenda planning meeting to see what is going on. There has been no, at no point has anyone said that they want to come in my tenure that I have said you're not welcome to be there. So I don't know, I guess my question is, are you saying that you're making that request? Um, I don't feel that we need to just go through and put in names at this point. You, again, you are welcome to come to the okay. meeting as long as there are three board members in that room. So there's no time, if you want to attend, you can contact, I would prefer me, Dr. Chris, Dr. Polio, okay. so we don't get four people in the room. Then I'll follow up with the three of you, thank you. Yeah, I would say make sure let Teresa know and copy me so that we can make, if that were to, ha if that happens, so that we make sure there's not more than three. Okay. That's all we would ask. And that would be thank the you. same for every board member. Everyone is entitled to come to that meeting. It's, you know, uh, you're welcome as long as we don't get four people in the room. Is that okay? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you. At this point, is there a motion to receive the planning calendar? I think we got the motion and we got the second. So any other questions? All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Committee reports, are there any committee reports? Board member Duncan. Uh, Dr. Polio stole my thunder a while ago when he reported on the policy committee. We did meet last night and uh, we will meet again uh, January 21st at 5.30, and everybody is welcome uh, to look at the standard operating procedures that will be presented uh, related to this policy. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other committee reports? Okay, moving on to board reports. Are there any board reports? Board Member Brady. Thank you, Chair. I uh, just want to, uh, for the record, invite everyone to come out uh, to the community meeting that will be this coming Thursday at Eastern High School at 530 to discuss the proposal for the new middle school that's going to be built um, that has been under discussion earlier this evening. Uh, this is a, a, a required community meeting by board policy, but just because it's required doesn't mean we really don't want you there. We do. And um, we do value that input. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard, uh, and we invite everyone to come out there. Again, that's going to be this coming Thursday at Eastern High School at 530. Um, in addition to that, I would also like to send out some thanks to uh, Jared Durham and all the staff over at J-Town High School. Uh, for hosting Leadership Louisville, as well as thanking Leadership Louisville for uh, bringing the uh, 2020 uh, Leadership Louisville class to J-Town and touring JCPS facilities today. Uh, they toured Hartstern, um, W.E.B. Du Bois, J-Town, and Newcomer Academy, if memory serves. Uh, I know they heard from Dr. Polio earlier this morning. Um, and uh, uh, Chair Porter, uh, Member uh, Scholl, Member Craig, and myself were all there to be able to answer questions. Uh, that's one of my favorite days of the year to be able to talk to the Leadership Louisville class because we hear so often, wow, I didn't know GC JCPS did that. I didn't know this particular program was being offered. And it really gives, uh, hopefully, our future community leaders a chance to be able to come into our schools and learn about the great things we're doing and dispel some of the uh, misconceptions that what, you know, what this school district is all about. So I just want to send... Uh, thanks to all the staff. I know uh, uh, Dr. Coleman was out there as well and some of her staff uh, talking about backpacks and just want to say thank you to the staff for putting all that together and also again to Leadership Louisville and to J-Town for hosting. Other board reports. Quickly, I'd like to ditto the fact that we were invited to come to J-Town High School today to speak to Leadership Louisville class. Uh, this has happened over a number of years and um, the opportunity is for the group to break up into smaller groups and ask questions that they might have about um, education in the Jefferson County Public Schools. My hope and desire is that in answering those questions and expressing the concern that it, education is a community effort that they will in fact join us on the journey for providing the quality education. Also, I want to mention again that I was at um, California Community Center for the closing ceremony for literacy and hip hop and um, this week I received a phone call from someone that had been at a cheerleading um, 
whatever you do, the competition, I guess it's called. And they called to tell me that they were amazed by the cheerleaders at Bick Elementary School. So I would like to put that out for everyone to know that the cheerleaders are well coached and well performed. And the person that called me said other parents were so inspired that they were willing to step up and make sure that they bring some equity to the cheerleading uh, cheerleaders at uh, Bick Elementary School. So those are the three things that I would like to report uh, this evening. At this point, uh, if there are no other reports, according to uh, my phone, it's 9.45 p.m. Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Board member Craig, seconded by Pastor Shul. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Great first meeting. <laughs>